But firstly, Hannah, Graham, James, thank you for giving up an hour of your time and, um, and joining me tonight. So we're not going to do intros. Everyone knows who you guys are. We're going to, so we're going to come to Graham first. CBD, really, interest, really interesting topic. So people have heard a lot about it. And I think a good place for, to start would be just to give us a bit of an intro on, on what it is. And then we can, we can go from there and Hannah and James can, can dive in as we go. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having us tonight. <clears throat> just, uh, apologies for a cough now and again. I'm just getting over the, <clears throat> the dreaded lurgy. Um, yeah, CBD, if you'd asked me about five years ago, I actually couldn't have spelt CBD to you five years ago, Rob, never mind tell you much about it. And it all started with one of the players within England rugby asked me about CBD and could he, he take it? And at the time, it was a really simple conversation once I'd looked up what it was. So obviously cannabidiol, one of the cannabinoids found within the, the cannabis plant. And it was a simple conversation then because it was prohibited by WADA. You jump forward a few years and WADA, in their wisdom, and you may sense the irony there in my voice, decide to remove CBD from the prohibited list, but leave all other cannabinoids on there which then creates a little bit of a dilemma because technically an athlete can take CBD, uh, but taking it in a way that isn't going to cause an anti-doping violation is a little bit of a problem. If we skip back a step and what actually is it? Well, if we look at the, the, the cannabis plant and particularly the strain that is grown for hemp, so a strain that has to be grown that has a very low concentration of the major psychotropic cannabinoid THC, so tetrahydrocannabinol, this is the, the one that gets the, the high, then it can be classed as hemp. And then within the hemp plant, there's probably 140 cannabinoids. So these are a different compound that interacts with the body's own endocannabinoid system. Uh, and one that we became really interested in is CBD, cannabidiol. Not prohibited by WADA, um, not illegal as a, as a product, and numerous suggested therapeutic claims around it. Uh, and some of these claims are pretty well investigated. So Epidiolex, which is a CBD product, that's what's licensed to treat things like Dravet syndrome, where you get these multiple epileptic seizures a day, and it can have profound effects on that. But from a sporting world, there's claims around it helping with muscle soreness, helping with muscle regeneration, helping with inflammation, helping to improve sleep quality. And perhaps most exciting um, is suggestions that it may help reduce the risk of traumatic brain injury. So you can see loads of reasons why an athlete would be interested in it. However, the way that WADA have removed it off the doping list and what they've left on, has just created an absolute minefield for athletes. So where's the best place to go? Where, where can people sift through that minefield to actually get to know what products they can and what products they can't take? Uh, look, if I'm going to be simple at the moment, if you're working with a drug-tested athlete, anyone who's under WADA restrictions, just don't do it. It's as simple as that. I must be getting weekly emails at the moment from people involved in high profile sports saying um, we've had a her sample taken and athletes got a positive. What's, is there a, any rationale why it could have come from CBD? We're going to see numerous athletes failing anti-doping tests because of this. Um, we, we, there's already at least two cases uh, from America, uh, one being a snowboarder or a skier, sorry, and the other one, uh, a triathlete where they've got sanctions for CBD related or claims that it's a CBD related um, issue. Now, in America, the USC and the NBA have both removed cannabis from the testing list at the moment. And until I think all the cannabinoids are removed, I just don't think it's worth the risk. So everyone's aware of THC, the, the psychotropic cannabinoid. And when you see a CBD product, it might say it's THC free. It won't be unless it's a synthetic, but it'll be below a limit of detection. 
And that's okay, that's fine. But chances are you're not going to fail a doping test on THC. You still might. We don't know if it accumulates, but the chances are you won't. When it says it's THC free, though, it doesn't say it's free of all the other cannabinoids. And bear in mind, WADA have only removed CBD. And when I've tried to ask the question to WADA about, are you testing for other cannabinoids? The only answer I get is we could. So they're not saying that they are, but they, technically they could. So they could decide to run a screen for other major psychotropic cannabinoids, which may be in a CBD product in trace amounts, and suddenly an athlete fails um, <clears throat> an anti-doping test. So, so my advice at the moment is, and it's, I'm almost sad to say this because my reading of the literature is that this could actually be quite a promising compound. It could help with muscle soreness. I've got players who tell me it does. It could help with sleep, particularly sleep's anxiety related. Uh, it could help with inflammation. And if it helps with traumatic brain injury, and there is research granted in animal models, but it is there, if it helps with concussion, traumatic brain injury, and we've got a product here that can maybe help stop a neurodegenerative disease, then it, it, it's almost criminal that we're not allowed to look at it. But until WADA change the wording, and all the wording needs to change to is name the cannabinoids that they want prohibited, rather than name the one cannabinoid that's allowed. So it's a very subtle switch. So instead of saying all cannabinoids are banned, but you can take CBD, if what they said was um, the cannabinoids which are prohibited are THC and maybe one or two others, well, then we can test for that. We can get an informed sport CBD certificate that's tested for that, and we can use it. But because we don't even know what cannabinoids are found within a plant, how can we even begin to test to know if it's safe for an athlete to take from an anti-doping perspective? It's just too much of a minefield, Rob. So my advice at the moment is, until WADA help us out a bit, um, we probably shouldn't go there. I'm keen to get Hannah and James's take on this, but just one, one last question, Graham. Is it just a matter of time before that happens? As people put pressure on? Or I think is, so. Okay. No, I think so. We've seen it, like I say, the UFC have removed all, um, all marijuana-based products from testing. So it, I think their wording is, unless you are visibly uh, under the influence walking into the octagon, that's it. You're okay in UFC. In, the, in basketball, in the NBA... This is the second season now where technically it's still prohibited cannabis, but they've stopped testing for it. And they've announced that they're not testing for it anymore. So that's probably the way forward because of pressure from a variety of situations. And I did read that WADA are currently re-looking at their cannabis uh, regulations. Now, I don't think, well, we know nothing's changed for this year. Whether it will change in time for January next year, I doubt it, but... I would envisage in the next two or three years we see WADA even stopping testing for any cannabis-related compound. Right, thanks, mate. Hannah, James, has this come across your desk often in terms of questions from athletes of what they should do, how they can navigate the minefield, as Graham said? Yeah, I would say I know, um, obviously, through Graham and others that work in rugby, it seems to be quite a big topic in rugby obviously because of being a collision sport and the um kind of function of it being around pain management and um, we don't see it so much in football but it's definitely being spoken about and again we're the same it's just don't take it because the risks are too high at the moment and it's a bit of a a bit of a minefield um but one product um on the market is like a it's a it's called pea i mean i won't even start to try and pronounce that either um, I think it's by Healthspan Elite and it's like called Levagen Plus and it's basically a fatty acid amide that works in a similar way on the endocannabinoid system um, that is um, on the Informed Sport Programme and it is tested. But again, there's such limited research on it um, yet to say this 100% works and works in the same way as, as CBD and I'm by no means an expert in the topic, but that's something that we we have tried um obviously in the world of elite sport with an mdt approach i can't say oh 100 that made the difference to this this player but it's something we have used and is legal and safe safe to use and is working in a similar way 
Um, but but yeah, in terms of CBD, no, it's something that we we definitely avoid using at the moment. Yeah, so, so that's palmitol ethanolamide, uh, PEA. Oh, there you go. If a Wiganer can pronounce it, I knew, I knew sure, he'd be able to say it. <laughs> I'm sure anyone can. And, and you're exactly right. There, there is some mechanisms whereby uh, it can work downstream of CBD and interact with the CB cannabinoid receptors, both uh, CB1 and CB2, and also affect these TRPV calcium channels as well. So there is a clear mechanism. There was a really nice talk at ISENC a couple of years ago on on palmitol ethanolamide. And I know a few practitioners who have been using it um, and seem to report some benefits on it. So it probably is the um, safest pathway to try that type of thing. I know there's some synthetic CBDs on the market, you know, um, Purist is the main one, which is actually uh, Chanel McCoy, AP McCoy's wife's company. Um, and the idea of a synthetic is it will only have CBD in it. Um, but I, I still have some reservations around that because there is some suggestions that the body may be able to convert some CBD to THC. And there is also some suggestion that um, it can convert within the bottle if it's not stored particularly well. So there's still some major questions even around that. But I would say that the two safest ones, you're right, palmitol ethanolamide uh, or something like a synthetic but I would still at the moment urge on the side of caution I um, I'll hold my hands up and say that I was one of the annoying people that messaged Graham to uh, to ask his advice because um, yeah being in Bristol Bears for the the limited few months I have it I've, I've had four or five conversations with First team players, um, women's players. I've seen products in lockers and and kind of not known about it, and had to have the discussion with players. And and look, the reality is on on the ground running as a practitioner. If if I speak to Graham and Graham's advice with Graham's knowledge and the research that he's doing is look, stay away from it at the moment. Then that's that's exactly what I'm feeding back into the athlete. And if they want to know the reasons why then I'll, I'll share some of the figures that Graham and Andy Casper have put forward in, in some of their kind of review articles around it. Um, and and the, the question that I will always ask the player really is if we're, if we're seeking that product at the moment, then you're almost telling me that you're nailing every other aspect of nutrition that we, that we do know can support recovery. Um, and the amount of missing windows that I see with players you know, it might be consuming enough protein through the day. It might be getting the oily fish in each week. But there's there's so many windows of opportunities to go after first before I think we have to entertain the conversation of, quite frankly, a, a chemical compound that seems to be a big risk at the moment. Um, and and I think when you reframe that with the athlete, quite quite often they will then be on your side and be like, yeah, fair enough. I'm I'm not even having enough protein, let alone trying to consume a CBD product. Perfect. Thanks, mate. We'll, we'll use that as a bit of a, an end point to that, to that point. I think that's uh, been nicely covered, although I probably think we could take the uh, the rest of the hour on that. But supplements, Hannah, just coming to you next. And I reviewed, I actually reviewed Graham's UKCA talk from a couple of years ago on, on supplements um, in preparation for, for, for this. But no matter how much... Graham speaks at UKC, or James speaks, or you speak, Hannah, that this supplements will always be the question of what can we trust, what do we know works? So over to you on that point. <laughs> so, I mean, people are probably aware just from the amount of um, marketing and media coverage there is on supplements, there's so, so much out there, and it's a billion pound market, and a, again, a bit of a minefield because everything is so freely available for anyone to purchase, you know, Amazon next day, it can probably arrive, but when we're working with athletes that, um, you know, are governed by WADA and can be can be um, tested, it's so important that the product is safe, legal, and also there's evidence to prove that it actually works. Um, and again, just to touch on what James mentioned, before we head down the route of supplements, the majority of the time, you want to make sure that you've tapped into their whole food nutrition first, because ultimately that's going to have the biggest impact. And then you can look towards the supplements. So 
in terms of what's available in the market and how much there is out there, it's actually a real small proportion of that that's actually okay for athletes to use and that there's evidence that it, it you know, produces the desired outcome. Um, and then you can look at splitting them into kind of groups. So you've got your sports foods, which basically provide a kind of um, convenient way of getting nutrients in like your um, carbohydrate, electrolyte, drinks, gels, um, protein powders, bars, You've then got supplements that have a direct impact on performance. So things like nitrate, creatine, um, your buffering agents like sodium bicarb and uh, beta alanine. You've got caffeine as well, which is probably one of the most um, commonly used. You've got ones that have an indirect effect on performance. So often through recovery, um, that's something like omega-3 um, and turmeric is, is being used more uh, commonly at the moment. And then you've got your kind of health and well-being supplements like your probiotics, um, vitamin D, calcium, iron as well. So you've got a, a real range. Um, but again, when you're looking at what's available as a whole, it's actually quite a select few that are proven um, and also legal and safe for, for athletes to be going, going ahead and using. Everything you mentioned just there, I'm thinking of all the Instagram ads that I'm seeing on a daily basis and Facebook ads for every single one of them things. But turmeric is one that I think it must be a footballer who's got involved. Is it the um, can um, yeah. Robson Canu? Canu. Yeah. yeah, he's selling to me on a daily yeah. basis is uh, Robson Canu. Yeah. So yeah. what's the, what's the, supposed to be the benefit of turmeric, Anna? So turmeric has um, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. So, um, is the kind of thing you can add in as a spice in your diet, you know, without it being such a concentrated form of it. But now you've, you'll see even in the supermarkets, you've got them um, drinks and shots. Um, you can get tablets now as well. Um, and yeah, there's, there's growing evidence for it as a kind of an anti-inflammatory. It's something that we th try and throw into foods on a, um, you know, throw it into a curry recipe, for example, the day after a game. Um, we do often use the shots as well, just a nice little addition to breakfast and try and um, kind of specialise them um, around certain times of the week and when we're going to experience a lot of muscle damage, for example. So that's where the evidence lies with that, yeah. What is the biggest, the most common thing that comes in open conversation? I'll throw this out to you, all of you guys. I think it's a bit interesting question to get some, uh, get some interesting answers. What's the most common thing that comes across your desk in conversation that is the biggest waste of money that people are so easily roped in with? Good question. Um, God, because I'm trying to think, we tr obviously try and promote their players to like come forward if they're mm. approached by anyone outside of the club um, and they're given, you know, like they're quite, I'd say they're quite clued up in that they know, you know, if someone's to, come along and say something really far-fetched they would know that they need to say no or come and ask beforehand in terms of biggest um biggest waste of money i'm trying to think well while, while you're thinking of that one i'll come in with um one well, i'll give you a second I'll, I'll help you out here a bit yeah uh, it's not exactly a supplement i'm allowed to get away with this rob why i'm letting hannah and james think go go, to, go for it i'm trying to help the team out here <laughs> well, i would say allergy testing or that type of genetic allergy. I've gone and seen someone's done at Rumbies tests on me, and these are the foods that I can and can't eat anymore. And I've got this allergy, and I've paid a fortune, and I'm paying this crank a thousand pound a session. And despite me having milk every day of my life and becoming a pro athlete and never having any symptoms ever, I've now decided I've got a milk allergy. So can you swap all the team's milk to almond? And they've spent a fortune, and it's absolute quackery. So I would say that's the biggest thing I've seen my athletes waste their money on. Fortunately, as Hannah said, you know, whether, we, you know, we're lucky in a way, but there's not many people that I've worked with who go and waste money on supplements because we've got the sense to speak with us first. Even it's just checking it from an anti-doping perspective um, before they go and waste the money. But the one that I do get is when they rock up with allergy reports and my heart sinks because I've just got to sit there and say, you've just been scammed. This is based on bloods, Graham? Um, it can be based on many things, can it? Okay. Bloods, yeah. uh, saliva. 
it's generally the IgG kits whereby you eat a food and you will mount some kind of an IgG response to it. Uh, but then people overinterpret that as being a problem. So the, the classic one I've seen quite a bit is where somebody has a milk intolerance. So they come off milk, they repeat it in six months time and suddenly they've got an almond intolerance. Well, that's because you've been having almond milk every day of your life, but you didn't have that six months ago. And um, it, it, you often, it, it makes me laugh because often the foods that come out a food that plays eating every day. And then it's a hard conversation because they're generally looking for an answer to something like, I can't lose weight. But so I did this test and it, yeah, I've got this allergy to breads and, um, and pasta and alcohol and, and dairy. So if I cut all that out, I'll lose weight. I'm like, well, yeah, of course you will. You've cut out a quarter of your calories, but it, it's an easy sale, isn't it? And, I sometimes wish I had no morals because you can make an absolute fortune on these things. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And then on the back of it, you can put a whole load of quackery service that goes with it too. But um, yeah, I'm, like, I'm yet to be convinced that there's absolutely anything in them. That's not me dismissing allergies, for example. You know, if somebody has got a genuine allergy, then there's lots we can do about it. We need to go and get it properly diagnosed and... And now with the emergence of like the low FODMAP diets and that, there's lots we can do about it. But don't think you can go and do a fingertip blood sample, send it off, and suddenly you know every food in the world that you're allergic to. Look, if life was that simple, we wouldn't do colonoscopies on children who we suspect having celiac. The medical profession isn't evil. If all you had to do was a fingertip sample and you could diagnose all this, you wouldn't be doing all these horrible invasive tests that you have to do to diagnose these things properly. So, um, yeah, I think they're ones that prey on uh, on vulnerability. Yeah, that, that's a really good point from Graham. Actually, one of the first um, first times I worked with a, a specific athlete, they came to me and said, uh, handed me a sheet actually of an intolerance test they'd had. And honestly, the list on there was unbelievable of what they couldn't eat, it included every milk you can imagine and cherries there was a, a list of fruit they can eat so once I'd explained to them um, that these tests weren't very reliable and accurate we started reintroducing these foods into their diet and sure enough they were absolutely fine so um, he was pretty glad about that as well because we'd pretty much stripped out most most foods from his diet with this um, intolerance testing but yes on to my answer um, I would say now this supplement by the way is perfectly legal it's safe and can be effective but I think a lot of people waste money on it and it's BCAAs and that's because a lot of the time they're actually you know they're having enough protein and they're having whole protein with enough of these essential amino acids in but then they feel the need to spend a load of money on a specific BCAA product and add that in as well they think it's going to have the magic effect and I was in the gym the other day actually listening to two guys chatting about how they were going to buy their whey protein and a, and a load of BCAAs late, um, later on that day. And I just thought, oh, you've got no idea what, what the purpose of them is. So, yeah, that's what I would say is, is probably a biggest waste of money for a lot of people because they don't realise that actually they don't need them. Um, you know, if you're having a potentially like a on a vegan diet and you've got a plant-based uh, protein that maybe doesn't have an optimal amount of um, branched chain amino acids in, then yes, potentially you might want to add a bit of that in. But majority of the time it's not needed so that would be the one for me it's part of the the sun uh, the weekend warriors toolkit the bcaa isn't it just kills <laughs> kills them all it. yeah thanks Anna. james i would um just bolt on to the back of that there and and almost reframe your question what do what are athletes not spending enough money on and i think quite often they're they're happy to go and spend a fiver on a flat white and a, a cake at costa or other franchises that are out there um but not willing to go to the local farmer's market and get 10 quid's worth of fruit and vegetables and and i think like when i've had the conversations with athletes to say you're quite happy to go out and spend 22 pound on a meal once a week but then you moan at me when i'm asking you to go and get some frozen berries for some smoothies, for example. And I think just reminding them how cheap food can be sometimes and, and then linking into what Hannah's saying there about, you know, you, you can consume enough protein through food and, and, and get the goodness that you need. 
just by going local. Um, so I, a lot of my discussions now are trying to get players to buy food again, rather than just the reliance on powder coming out of a, a supplement tub every day. So, so Rob, if you want me to answer the question why James has avoided it, um, it's quite <laughs> nice. I like that. It's very, very political, isn't it? I won't answer your question, but I'll make a different one up. Good work, James. Um, let, let me give you one, and I'm sure no one will disagree here. Let's just put the fat burners in that category. Mm-hmm. You know, so are they still are they still people get, yeah. still get sucked in? Don't they're they? still they're still there. They're still oh, sucking wow. people in. You know, <laughs> as I always say, you'll burn more calories walking to a shop to buy them than what you will do actually taking them. Um, you know, we, we can throw some other things into that category. But yeah, if there was one thing that I was going to discourage anyone from buying, would be a fat burner. If you really could burn significant amounts of body fat in a tablet, the world wouldn't have an obesity crisis. We'd just take that one tablet and crack on with a day, wouldn't we? So um, yeah, let, there you go. We'll give you one. But there's, there's a supplement. I've given you one. Hannah's given you one. And James just makes up his own questions, which is which is fine. Is I want to do it. I'll just piggyback on back on the back of what you said, James. Do you think? And you guys have been around long enough to answer this question. Do you think there is a shift towards athletes caring more about where their food comes from? I'm interested in this on a just social scale, but obviously you guys working with athletes, I'm interested to know. So going to the butchers try to understand, you know, where that meat comes from, the quality of it, et cetera. Is there actually a shift in a positive way? What I think is a reflection of society as well, hopefully. What's your thoughts, Hannah? Yeah, I I think I've definitely seen a shift in this. Um, I'd say in the last couple of years, and it's, I think, more so probably around um, the environmental crisis. So we place a big emphasis on um, buying food locally, and we have our own kitchen garden um, at Spurs so try and grow um, like seasonal fruit and veg and use that, um, you know, within our foods there at, at the club. And then also just noticing um, a shift in mindset of players as well around, um, you know, like a flexitarian approach and not all suddenly becoming vegan, but being more mindful of um, how often they're eating meat and um, where they're buying their fruit and veg from. So looking at you know, has it been shipped from Africa because it's not in season at the moment, in which case it's going to have a really high carbon footprint and and things like that, which is re- really nice to hear. So from, from that point of view, I'd say, yeah, there's been a shift. And I think um, in particular for, for environmental reasons. Anything from you two guys, James? Yeah, I think the, the documentaries that we've seen on Netflix as well recently, like, you know, we've all been there and watched it. Um, and look, they, that sparked some some really good and interesting conversations, um, both at the FA when I was there, but also now at Bristol. And I, I think people are, I think people are aware of it. I, I think where possible, you know, it's a great idea that Hannah's got there at Spurs with their own garden. And, and I think it's important. And We've got players at, at Bristol that have got their own chickens. And I, I know, Rob, that's something that you're passionate about. Absolutely. Um, the other half, I want to talk about chickens, mate. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, I, I'm seeing a shift and 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 probably, you know, myself as well. I'm, I'm always trying to support the local fruit farm market um, in Vista. So, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a shift. Graham? Yeah, in, in some, in others, not so much. Uh, but, yeah. You're certainly getting asked questions that you weren't asked a few years ago, and particularly in a rugby environment that, you know, a, f- a few years ago, if you took away the pie and chips, you would have got a lot of abuse. And it's gone full circle now, but if you put pie and chips out, you'd probably get a lot of abuse. But how do you expect me to um, perform to my best when that's what you're feeding me? So it really has, you know, has changed a lot. There is, as Hannah said, a big awareness for environmental issues, you know, trying to reduce plastic waste where we can, uh, trying to reduce food waste. You know, there's a lot of players, particularly because we do a lot of buffet eating. And that question comes to me a lot about, you know, how can we minimise the food waste? Got people genuinely care. Um, And then, you know, yes, I think we only need to see some players' social media and thinking of players who both me and James work with doing a lot of work promoting local farm shops and, you know, about the importance of of buying good quality vegetables local. So, yeah, huge change um, and, and for the better, yeah. 
James mentioned the, the Netflix documentaries, and I'm sure there was a well, no, there was an influx of players at Yardar when that I can't remember what the, the name of the uh, veganism documentary was. What the health or game changers? Or... Yeah, yeah, or game changers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Has that, do you think that was a positive thing? It may it may have caused a little bit of controversy at the time, but do you think that was a positive thing? That's kind of running, and it's a couple of years ago now, but it's still having effects in a positive sense to make people question what they're actually eating to an extent yes i think anything where there's so much um misinformation i, I, I want to be careful how, how positive i say that it, it is but you're right in as much as i think it really got people thinking about what they eat a lot more uh and what the, the power you can get from from food and you know I, i've said for many years that I think all athletes should be plant-based. I just don't think they should be plant-exclusive unless they want to. And if somebody wants to do it for moral and ethical reasons, 100% they're called brilliant. I'll support you and I'll help you the best I can. Um, but I do think athletes should be plant-based. And, and I'm not sure many nutritionists, dietitians would disagree with me. And what I mean by that is a massive portion of every plate should be vegetables, carbohydrates, rice, you know, foods like that. And then on top of that, a good portion of lean protein, you know, you know, so we can get plant-based with a nice piece of salmon, cod, chicken, some eggs or whatever, then great. And I think one thing that it did do was really push to the athletes, the importance of plant-based foods. You know, it really did emphasize as we know, the importance of carbohydrates for high intensity exercise, which has been hijacked a bit over the last few years with some of the like um, keto style approach to uh, to performance. So I think it was good that it readdressed that balance. But you've kind of got two big myths. You've got the keto and the what the health or whatever it was called, game changers. And somewhere in the middle of them two is probably the the, the degree of common sense that we need to get to. How many of the new vegans that came off the back of Game Changers have actually, I mean, you guys may not be working at the same place, the same athletes have actually followed through and carried on with that? Many? Zero. 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 From, I've mm. had a couple try it, but none have stuck it out. Um, but what they have done, I mean, there were quite a few, is if we put a, a plant based dish on, so we put a vegan dish of a day on at a, an elite team that I work with it's surprising how many non-plant-based athletes will try it and enjoy it and I think what it's done is it's destigmatized that you're not a freak if you don't want to eat meat which is how it used to be wasn't it it was almost like you had to say it under your breath I'm a vegan you know and it almost a little bit and I think it, it's been very good for that and you know I, I'm as convinced that with the right support and with one or two things added to the diet that you can you know, be a, a pro athlete eating that way. I've, I've got no uh, qualms about it. Uh, and what it has done, I think, is really, as you said, encouraged a realisation about all the good stuff you can get in plants. Taking us on to our next point, and obviously Graham's got just a little bit of experience in this as well, but nutrition tweaks for collision sport athletes. I'm going to fire that over to, to James, if that's all right. Maybe pull it in some of the stuff we've already spoken about. Yeah, so I think we've we've covered a fair fair chunk of it already. But so, some of the 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 big work ons that I've done initially at you know Bristol that where I work now is is just getting them to understand the importance of regular protein intake and and also and I don't I don't want to teach people to suck suck eggs on the call, but making sure that they're hitting their total daily amount at regular time points throughout the day. And it, it's amazing. Certainly, I'm I'm seeing in a female athlete how many struggle to eat in the mornings or or they're rushing because they have to go to work and and before you know it they've they've had their kind of overnight sleep they've had minimal protein in the morning they've then had a full day at work and then they're presenting at training at four or five o'clock in the afternoon and they might have had a protein bar throughout the day um and then it, you know if that's an individual that's that's genuinely trying to gain a little bit of lean mass We've, we've probably got a problem there because the total daily amount of protein is going to be nowhere near to where it needs to be. So one of my first conversations with them is, is 
asking them about what protein looks like in their day and 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 at time points. I think outside of that, it's it's then getting them to genuinely understand how important carbohydrates is for the professional athlete. Um, I've seen it in both the, the men and, and the females, probably more in the females. And, and it was the same at England football was um, a number of athletes that seem to be a bit carbophobic because of the pressure of body composition or, you know, they're going into a media shoot after and, and they want to they want to look slim. Um, we've also, you know, I've unfortunately seen players under fueling quite substantially at meal times and the knock on effect that that then has for injury risk and some players getting injured. I'm not saying it's it's all to do with nutrition, but when you can visibly see the athlete under fueling at meal times, there's a known eating disorder. And then, um, you know, lean mass is beginning to drop off quite dramatically. And then an injury happens. You, as a practitioner, you look at that and you think, Christ, there's, there's a real problem there with, with that uneducation um, within that setup. So I think the, the education of, around carbohydrate and protein is massive. And then where, where I've tried to, to get that into some of the goals and the quick, easy nutrition wins is in and around smoothies. Like there's, there's so many that think that it always has to be eaten and and actually you can get a good five six hundred calorie smoothie blended up within 30 seconds with a pretty decent amount of nutrition in there from multiple different things protein fat carbs um and so they they've been some quick wins for for the athlete um and then we've already touched on it um hannah mentions kind of some of the turmeric um there's there's a lot of work work in the, in the cherry active space or, or the Mont Morrissey tart cherry juice. Um, you've got the oily fish. So making sure we've got the omega threes and, and the oily fish is going in each week. Um, and then outside of that, I think just making sure that we're nailing that high protein intake post big training session and or game. Um, and, and there's some of my players that quite often it's finish a game and then straight down to the KFC and, it's the bargain bucket being consumed and then they wonder why they've been hit by a sledgehammer the next day. <laughs> so there, there are a few of the tweets that are pretty live this season that I'm, I'm kind of having conversations with at the club. Yeah, just to pick up on something you said at the beginning, why would you want to teach anyone to suck an egg? Surely that's a choking hazard. Yeah, true. But I think I've heard that that phrase come out of your mouth at a conference I'm before. I'm sure you're far better chewing on an egg than sucking on one. You're not <laughs> going to get anywhere sucking on an egg. <laughs> just, sorry, I just had to make that point. Um, the only thing I would add to what James has said there is, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at the minute detail, but then often, you know, miss the bigger picture, don't we? Um you know, James Hudson, one of my PhD students who's a nutritionist at, at Gloucester, he did, he's published some great work on the, the stuff that he's done at Gloucester Rugby. Uh, I've got, I was actually looking at his thesis today, you know, a couple of unpublished bits as well. And what's fascinating is if we look at the big picture, the day after a rugby game, in some players, there was a 500 kilocal increase in resting metabolic rate. So the total caloric intake needs went up by about 500 kilocals, even just at rest. That's the body crying out for nutrition to recover. And one thing I've seen a lot the day after games, because people do feel like they've been run over by a bus, they might stay in bed a little bit longer, which might mean they might skip breakfast or they might not feel like eating. And on a day that the body is crying out for food can often be quite a poor eating day. So before we get into all the you know, small things that may or may not help. There's one thing that definitely will help, which is eating and eating enough food and actually getting the right total in you. And what was also fascinating from James's work, and we did some metabolomics, um, so we can measure the entire metabolome. Uh, and contrary to our hypothesis, what we were seeing in the days after a game was, yes, there was an increase in protein catabolism, but it appeared that that was to provide substrates for gluconeogenesis. So the body's crying out for carbohydrate in these days after a game, and he's generating it by breaking down muscle tissue. So not only do we need to make sure we eat enough, but it can't just be, let's feed more protein, feed more protein. Rugby guys are pretty good at eating protein. In fact, I find most athletes are. You know, 
if you put a buffet out, the first thing that goes is the steak and the chicken. The last thing that goes is a green veg with the pasta in between. So I don't think we need to have that big emphasis on protein the day after a game. But I do think we do need it on calories and on uh, on carbohydrate as well. Uh, I've just noticed, I don't know, Rob, there's a couple of questions popping up in the online chat. I don't know if we want to deal with them. Yeah. No more at the end. Yeah, we'll, we'll dive in at the end. We'll leave five or ten minutes to tackle them. Okay. Just on what Graham said, I, I would echo that, not just, um, obviously, these guys are working in rugby, but in other sports as well. I see it all the time, day after a game. It's often a recovery a recovery day. We don't do much or you're off. Um, and you'll notice even when players are in at the club, you're constantly emphasising, especially with that starting 11, um, you know, come in for a good breakfast. And we, we often change up what's on offer to really encourage them to choose the right foods. We might put, put out, you know, the higher carbohydrate options like bagels, whereas they might not be out every day of the week, things like that. Um, lots of antioxidant foods. But it's just, you know, they, one, they're creature, creatures of habit and they choose the same breakfast that they had every day, regardless of the fact they've just played, you know, 90 minutes plus um, and have got a lot of muscle damage going on there. Like Graham said, you know, he's doing the research and finding that their energy, their resting metabolic rate that day is, is massively higher than, than other days. So it's essential that they're eating. And then all we find that, they feel like they haven't done much because it's a recovery day. So oh, I don't need to eat as much today um, or I'm tired. I'm just going to go home and rest. And they skip this massive windows of like snacking in the afternoon. So it could be a day where they just have three meals. And actually it's a day where, you know, it's almost more important than match day minus one. Otherwise you're not going to be able to play again. Um, not in your best state, you know, in three days time. So I'd agree it's, is something that we really, really focus on, but it's, it's a challenge for sure. Rob, just to, just to put it in perspective, and I remember presenting this, um, I can't remember where it was now, maybe ECSS, but the, the average rugby player is about 90 to 95 kilo, and a, a commercial fridge in someone's kitchen is roughly the same weight. So you've got one fr fridge running at two tacklers, so you've got about 300 kilo-ish of collision happening multiple time points in a game. And when, when you frame it up like that, it's no wonder that these guys are sore and damaged after a game because that's some serious power and force going into contact. And I think sometimes a rugby player forgets what they've just done the night before. Um, and, and, you know, kind of supporting what Graham's point is there about if they're, if they're laying in and missing that breakfast, then quite often they'll go out for a brunch or lunch. But they, they've almost missed the window of opportunity early on to get that energy in and to eat um and so yeah it's it's so important to fuel the damage and fuel for the repair um otherwise you know they, they will be struggling and, and bringing it in into the next day as well is there any guidelines that you would recommend based on some of the stuff that you've just presented there graham and, and james uh, in terms of grams per kilo body weight anything like that that people could give people a bit of a an idea of in terms of carbs and protein as a recommendation ballpark? Yeah. I mean, protein, I think, is almost pretty simple, really. Um, if we get north of 1.6 and closer to 2 grams per kilogram body mass of protein, I think whatever sport we're working in, we're going to be pretty, pretty good, really. I know the work from Stu Phillips and people like that is suggesting about 0.4 grams per kg per meal. So if we're going to feed a rugby player five times a day on 0.4 grams per kg, we're going to get up to two grams per kilogram, you know, about 200 grams of protein for a hundred kilo athlete, you know, four of them might be food and one or two could be shakes, snacks or something like that. Uh, then when it comes to carbohydrate, I don't think we're as definitive yet on, on, a, on a precise number. Uh, I tend to work between three and six grams per kilogram of rugby players. Um, three being at the lower end, six being like the day before a game and probably somewhere in between the day after a game. Uh, I don't go anywhere near as high as the 10 grams per kg that you see in textbooks. And, and that's all because I mainly work in rugby. And if we take a 100 kilo player and you put, put them on 10 grams per kilogram, you're now asking them to eat a kilogram of carbohydrate in a day. Uh, and good luck trying to eat a kilogram of carbohydrates 
uh, in, in the day. You know, it's um, what's that it's equivalent of what twenty large jacket potatoes. You know, it, it's a serious amount. And what we've got to remember is a lot of a gram per kilogram work on carbohydrate. When you look at the literature, there's two things that people forget. One, it was mainly done in 55 to 60 kilogram runners, um, which is very different to 100 kilo rugby players. And two, it's generally done when you've depleted glycogen and then you want to have a maximum muscle glycogen resynthesis. And it's very unusual in, in our hands to see full glycogen depletion. When we did the muscle biopsies, uh, that James was involved in years ago at Witness Vikings, you know, it was about 40% um, depletion of muscle glycogen during a game. So that's even after a game. So in some players, it was a bit more, which would begin to affect performance. But we're never down at zero, which is what a lot of the original carbohydrate research was based upon when you actually did a glycogen depletion protocol and then worked out how much to feed them to get maximum rates back. So, yeah, I, I work between three and six. One thing I would say um, on that, Rob, is if, if a player doesn't want to eat after a game and it's it's an eight o'clock kickoff, they, they might finish at 10. You know, there are some players that just really struggle to eat at that time of the day because they've just finished the game. It's, it's now even in time, adrenaline, they might be sore, they're, they're caffeined, you know, they've got a load of caffeine floating around, they might have to do a, a drug test. So there, there are players that really struggle to eat and, and that's, I guess, a window that would be important to not go to bed having not had anything because then you are waking up having an eight, 10 hour sleep without any nutrition at all. And I think, uh, Graham, I don't know whether you want to <laughs> share that we've just put that piece together. Um, but we would definitely encourage them to eat after a game and, and um, rather than not having anything at all. Any strategies that you'd undertake to actually make sure that happens for those that struggle? Well, we had, we had an example. So um, due, due to COVID restrictions, so granted, but, but one of the things that was on offer was a, was a pizza post game and it, wasn't, it, it didn't look the greatest and it wasn't the most sexy looking. And I, my first game, you know, about half of them went, but they weren't being eaten in the changing room. So I spoke to the players and said, why are you not eating it now? And they said, oh, no, I'll take it home for the family. So therein lies a problem for me that I've got a group of players not having anything post-game. So one of the things that we just improved straight away was the post-food offering. And, and we shifted it and, and we brought in different foods. We brought in a, a little bit of steaks, you know, chicken, smoothies, fruit, a um, little bit of dessert here and there. But the important thing was to just get them eating food, actually, instead of not having anything at all. And, you know, we had players after that that were coming in on recovery day. Feel, you know, I'm feeling a bit better now. You know, that that does make a difference. And so um, I, I think improvement of provision of food is, is something that can be massive. And this is a work in progress for me now every single week, trying to tweak and refine to make it better and better and better because... It, it always has to develop and change based on what some of the emerging research is. Yeah, I would say um, we experience similar similar issues and we're probably all in um, jobs at the moment where we have the luxury of, you know, we have a budget in that we can provide post-match food for players, um, whether that's rugby or football or whatever. But um, in, the, in the same kind of way, you've got to make it really attractive to them and work out what it is that they're actually wanting at that time because we have um athletes that yeah really suffer with appetite after or they're in a rush and you know it's a late it's a late evening kickoff and they just want to get away so we find that like finger food really works um and also having a selection of sweet and savory because you get some that absolutely don't want to go near sweet stuff after they've spent half the game um you know chugging down lucas aids and gels and stuff um, so it's things like in like takeaway pots, we have like a Singapore chicken noodles option, homemade chicken nuggets, um, banana loaf that's in like, you know, all sliced up, easy for them to take fruit skewers, things that like they can stand around picking at that are really easy to take. And then also if you've got someone that's really struggling with with appetite, they might have a bespoke smoothie. So whether you add, you know, berries into that banana, you might have to add a bit of extra 
um, you know, protein, carb, powder to make sure they're getting their requirements in there, but and make it milk based as well. Things like that. It's just, you know, working out what kind of trying to cover all bases really and trying to, I would say home games are, are worse. I've definitely spoken about this before, but home games are almost worse because they've got their cars and they're at home. We're not confined to a coach or a plane or um, so you haven't got them all captured there. So that I, we find that that's more challenging um, as well. But yeah, that, like James said, and just keeping it varied and trying to keep changing it up as well. Perfect. Thanks, Hannah. And Steve, sticking with you for now for the next five or so minutes before we just tackle them, them two questions that came in. Based on what we just said, how what changes when it comes to youth athlete and what principles would you encourage people stick by when working with youth athletes and considering nutrition? First and foremost, I would say when working with youth athletes, I think your priority shifts to being, you know, nutrition for growth and maturation first. You need to support that. And then performance is secondary because if you don't support the growth and maturation, then ultimately long-term performance is going to suffer. You know, if if bone mineral density doesn't re reach its peak, then, you know, further down the line, you might get issues with bone health and fractures. And if athletes aren't fueling properly, they're probably going to get regular illnesses, things like that. So I think that's really important to highlight first. And then another point I'd say is involving the parents and guardians because ultimately they they're the ones that probably buy the food and and prepare it as well so anyone working with youth athletes um from a nutrition point of view i think education is just absolutely massive and getting the parents and guardians involved as well um and then kind of onto the fundamentals i'd say you're looking at trying to encourage them to achieve their daily energy requirements but through whole foods um, Marcus Hannon has done some great research on um, academy footballers, but just showing what a minefield this can be and, and what a challenge it must be for parents because you've got, you know, players and athletes in the same age group doing the same training, but their daily energy expenditure is vastly different because someone's growing at a different rate to someone else. Someone might be doing, um, you know, something different at lunchtime at school, you know, running around the playground. Another one might not be doing that. So it's really challenging to kind of set guidelines there. And it'd be great to see some more research in that area. So because a lot of the time guidelines are extrapolated from your adult athlete population. Um, but yeah, ultimately trying to encourage the young athletes to achieve their energy requirements um, through whole foods and focusing on like probably five to six feeds a day. Those snacks are really important. So getting really good pr regular protein sources in there. Dairy is a great one because you're going to get a good um, calcium source in there, which is great for bone health. Um, so like yogurt pots um, with fruit, for example, as a snack. And then trying to get some carbohydrate within those feeds as well. Um, we know that in young athletes, they're, they're better at using fat as a fuel. So they're quite efficient. So again, making sure they've got the uh, range of good fats in the diet, like your salmon, nuts, cooking with olive oil when you can. Um, and then obviously um, your, your protein sources. And if you can get some of that from your dairy, then great because they get a hit of calcium. So with the young athletes, I would say, obviously we advise staying away from supplements, especially when they're, when they're under 18 um, and just focusing on that education and whole foods and just trying to make sure I think one of the most common trends you see with young athletes is that, that they're under fueling without realizing that like, people don't realize what their um, kind of energy expenditure is but I know from like Marcus's research I think there was someone in a in an under 18s age group where the under 18s like average energy expenditure was about 3,500 daily um, and you'd got a player expending 5,000 kilocalories so you can see the discrepancy there is absolutely massive um but yeah in in general just really education piece and focusing on those whole foods and and regular feeding so especially with a lot of like high performing young athletes you've got them going straight from school and they might have an hour journey to training um and it's quite easy to miss a window there where it's actually really important to eat so it's again about being prepared as well and it's hard for the parents um but yeah just you know anything like cereal bars smoothies that you can pack great nutrients into um, that are easy on the go yogurt pots with berries things like that um, some clubs I know you might have the luxury of providing athletes with pre and post training um, snacks or meals but a lot of the time that that's not the case so it falls on the parents 
a fact. Thanks, Hannah. We've only got a couple minutes left. Graham, James, any key principles maybe that Hannah didn't mention or things that have worked for you when it comes to youth athletes? James? Um, we had a really tough um, gig at, at the FA. We had two nutritionists and 15 national teams. And and one thing that we found really effective with the younger age athletes, so the under 15, 16, 17s at England, was to, to give them some case study examples of what their role models were doing. So quite often we would share, you know, and sometimes it might be a bit of a white lie, but, you know, th this is what Harry Kane is doing. This is what Sterling is eating. And, and just to show them, you know, look, this is what the senior lads are doing. And this is how their nutrition strategy looks, because quite often at that age, it was all about looking up at role models and who did they want to try and emulate within the national setup. So, so that's something that's worked quite well previously is, is trying to find what that young player's carrot is that they're going to hook onto and then just run full steam ahead with it. And, and quite often that role models is one that you can go down. Perfect. Thanks, mate. Right. We've got a couple of minutes for those questions. I'm going to go to Joanna's question first and come to Graham because you mentioned a little bit about this. So the question was, what blood checks would you recommend athletes to do regular, if any? Hey, Joanna. Uh, good to see you on here. Um, yeah, it's something I don't think we do enough in pro sport. Um, it's something I'm trying to get done a little bit more. Probably not a lot. It, from nutritionally, I'd, I'd quite to see us doing a, um, a bit more iron profiling. And by iron profiling, talking about ferritin, hemoglobin, and transferring saturation. You know, some great work from Peter Peelin, uh, showing how we can begin to diagnose different stages of iron deficiency rather than just do what we normally do, which is wait for hemoglobin to drop. And then by that stage, we, we've got some problems going on. So we, we know that, I think he, I think Pete's figure is around about 10 to 15% of males and higher in females will be iron deficient, but we don't measure it. So, you know, we do all this endurance training, but if you've got a genuine iron deficiency, then we're not maximising our chances to adapt to it so I think that's one um, of course I'm going to say vitamin D because of all the work I've done on vitamin D over the years um, I do think we've got a problem with vitamin D though in as much as we need to measure more than just 25 OHD you know I'd, I'd like to see other markers uh, and really begin to understand the vitamin D problem you know all I ever really see in the literature is another study showing that more athletes are low in 25 OHD we, we need to be better than that um, and then I'm becoming a little bit more interested in some of B vitamins as well. And there is a suggestion that even something like B12, whilst within an, an, an adequate range for the general population, there seems to be an optimal range for hemoglobin formation in athletes. So we need to measure these, but also come up with our own uh, reference values rather than just going on clinical ranges. So I think there's a lot more that can be done in that space. And, I, and I'll leave it there because I've, you know, I know you've got a few questions and I've hogged a bit of that one. That's fine, mate. Thank you. Uh, Hannah, the next one, oh, sorry, the first one maybe for you based on the BCAAs. I think it was you that mentioned it. Does it make sense between, I'll just read this out. Do BCAAs make sense between two sessions uh, when there's only a short break between, for example, a football player when they might do some weight training before they go on the pitch? Oh, unmute yourself, Anna. Oh, we got to 59 minutes. I, know, I, knew, I thought it was going to be me. Schoolboy <laughs> error. <laughs> Don't Damn. worry, carry on, um, carry on. Yes, no, in terms of that, I would say, yes, obviously, if you've got a short window in between sessions, it's not ideal and convenient to be eating a snack or a meal. But um, if you've got the opportunity to have BCAAs, I would just go for a whey protein um, and like a complete complete protein that contains all your amino acids and make sure it's got an optimal dose of BCAAs in. So yes, you might, if, you, if you've only got BCAAs laying around at home, then fine. But yeah, I would go for a whole, pro, a complete protein. So just a whey protein option. Yeah. Yeah. Kev Tipton, bless him. Uh, in 2017, I think Sarah Jackman was a lead author. Was it Frontiers Physiology? Compared BCAAs and a whey protein. And the whey was, um, twice as effective so some effectiveness from the BCAAs but nowhere near that of the of the way and the, the theory being is that the branch chain amino acids can 
um, start the anabolic response, but they don't provide the substrate. And that's where we need all the complement of the essential amino acids. So if you've only got a short turnaround, you know, bang a little way shaking. And, and if you've not got time to put away shaking, have a serious wobble of your head and ask why you're creating a situation that's putting an athlete in that situation where you can't give it 10 minutes and maximize what you're trying to achieve in that second session. So, um, yeah, give your head a wobble, I'd say. Oh, cool. cheers, Graham. Last one. Do you want to take that, James, from uh, Lawrence? Yeah, I mean, for me, I would, I would just stick with a standard whey protein, um, to be honest. that That's all I've ever done, and that's probably all I'll ever continue to do. Um, and, and just while I think of it, Graham, because I, I know this was a question that I used to ask you, if, if someone can't do blood testing for Vit D deficiency, what would what would be the recommendation for um, supplementation, obviously, through the winter months? Is it is it still the 1,000 IU, 2,000, 4,000? Yeah, if, if you can't blood test, you know, the vitamin D society and a few things. And when I first read this, I thought that sounds a bit crazy, but it does make sense. But once your shadow is longer than your height, the zenith angle of the sun probably means you're not getting the falter conversion of pre-hydrocholesterol to vitamin D in the skin. So when we start getting to these winter months where even on a sunny day, you've got nice long shadows, then we need to start thinking about vitamin D, probably around about October, November time uh, in, in the UK. And, you know, you're looking at maybe a bit even sooner, well, having said that, living in the UK, I can't remember the last time I saw the sun. I believe it exists, but I've not seen it for a while. Uh, rain, I can vouch for. Sun, I'm not so sure. And yeah, I would go about 2,000 IUs a day, James. The safe upper limit set by EFSA is 4,000. So you could go to 4,000 if you wanted, but in my experience, 2,000 corrects any problems. It's well within the safe upper limit, um, and it's an easy way to just implement a simple supplementation strategy. And we would continue that right through till we start getting some reasonable sun exposure uh, when you start getting towards that one week of the year when we see the sun in England. And then just, just on that, when the sun is out, I'm correct in saying that it's 10 to 15 minutes of sun, sun exposure and then apply the screen. Is that correct? It depends if you've got the skin complexion of myself and Rob. <laughs> if, you're, if you're up there, look, the, the advice is that what you better do, and this is even from like skin cancer type associations, is a small amount of unprotected and then get out of it. So whether, you know, if you've got skin complexion of me, that might only be five minutes, but you, you get face and arms exposure to get some vitamin D synthesis and then sunscreen on or even better, cover up clothing, get in the shade, you know, from a health perspective, lying in the sun all day, even with your fact of whatever on it isn't the best way forward. So yeah, you're exactly right with the big caveat of do not burn. Don't let, you know, anyone think that it's a good idea to get your vitamin D by going having 15 minutes and you've got the skin complexion that burns and you've done yourself some damage. So a short period of time, maybe up to maximum 15 minutes, do not burn. Yeah, best way to get vitamin D. On that vitamin D, we've been talking a lot about athletes and I'm going to push for time anyway. But for, for coaches and practitioners that are actually physios inside all day, that 2,000 IUs, Graham, could be pushed, should be pushed? Yeah, and, and it's something we've thought about a lot within England rugby recently about trying to support the staff that support the players. So when we're putting wellness packs together and things like that, um, trying to support the staff as well as the players. And exactly right, you know, last thing you want is... Um, people getting run down, ill, URTIs, and then spreading that throughout the team. Not only can it spread to the players, but your, your coaching might not be as effective. So, yeah, without doubt, that's not just for players. You know, that is society, really. Um, we, we know we can't get enough vitamin D if you're living at northerly latitudes. So, it, and, and it's not given as much attention as it probably should do, because to get enough vitamin D to last you for seven or eight months of the year that you need, will probably cost you 20 quid. It's such a cheap supplement. So uh, it's not really marketed because no one makes any profit on it. So, um, yeah, I, I'd advise all people to be considering a vitamin D supplement in the winter months. So would you push that towards the 4,000, which is the top end that you said? Yeah, two, four, two or 4,000. Okay. Um, the, the reason I tend to go two 
Is it 4,000? Is that F's a safe upper limit? I think there's a margin of error there, but let's just go with it. Um, and it, vitamin D's popping up in quite a few products now. So by me going 2,000, it just gives me a little bit of wiggle room should other supplements be containing a 1,000 or two. 